uh, <laughs> faith of our fathers. Uh, which one? He, he has brought us this far by his grace. Um, okay. Maybe let's stand since we'll be seated for quite some time. He has brought us this far by his grace. He has led us by far and by far out to meet us to Zion to look on his face. Oh, blessed, oh, blessed be God. Oh, sing, blessed, blessed be God. Blessed be God, blessed, oh blessed be God, oh sing blessed, blessed be God, blessed be God, blessed, oh blessed be God, he has sheltered us under his Plant every star that we've trod to bring us to Zion to presence to see. Oh, blessed, oh, blessed be God. Oh, sing, blessed, blessed be God. Blessed be God, blessed, oh, blessed be God. Oh, sing, blessed, blessed be God, blessed be God, blessed, oh, blessed be God. Indeed, we bless our God uh, for all the things that he has done uh, for us, and we are able to look back and also look ahead and bless his name. I'll ask our brother, uh, Elder Malipenga, to come and uh, open for us in prayer. Uh, thereafter, Pastor Rain, you can come. Thank you. Let us uh, pray together, shall we? Our Father in heaven, again, we are thankful for the opportunity we have to still our hearts before you and in your presence. Thank you for your word that was preached to us. And thank you for the lessons, the reminders, the rebukes, the encouragement, the instruction. Grateful also for the refreshment that uh, we've just had. Grant that uh, our bodies may be refreshed and strengthened and made all the more alert to listen attentively to the preaching of your word as the instruction comes to us through your servant, our brother Mark Reigns. Grant him the power in the presence of your Holy Spirit to enable him, Lord, to speak, to preach plainly, simply, and relevantly. And we pray that he, your presence will be among us and grant us the grace also to take in the word, the instruction as it comes to us that thereby we may be built up in this our most holy faith and be caused all the more to give ourselves to love the word of God, that it will be sweeter to us even more than the honeycomb in the language of David. Grant, O oh Lord, that he, you may speak to us it is you who knows the truest need of our hearts. Instruct us by your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen.
morning, everyone. Good to see you all again. Going to uh, be looking at Ezra this morning. Let's take our Bibles then and turn to Ezra chapter 7. Ezra 7, going to read the whole chapter. Now, after these things, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, the son of Sariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Hilkiah, the son of Shalom, the son of Zadok, the son of Ahitub, the son of Amariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Merioth, the son of Zerahiah, the son of Uzi, the son of Buki, the son of Abishur, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the chief priest. This Ezra came up from Babylon, and he was a skilled scribe, in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. The king granted him all his request according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. Some of the children of Israel, the priests, the Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the Nethanim came up to Jerusalem in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. And Ezra came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. On the first day of the first month, he began his journey from Babylon. And on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem according to the good hand of his God upon him. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it, and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. This is a copy of the letter that King Artaxerxes gave Ezra, the priest, the scribe, expert in the words of the commandments of the Lord and of his statutes to Israel. Artaxerxes, king of kings, to Ezra the priest, a scribe of the law of the God of heaven, perfect peace, and so forth. I issue a decree that all those of the people of Israel and the priests and Levites in my realm who volunteer to go up to Jerusalem may go with you. And whereas you are being sent by the king and his seven counselors to inquire concerning Judah and Jerusalem with regard to the law of your God which is in your hand. And whereas you are to carry the silver and gold which the king and his counselors have freely offered to the God of Israel whose dwelling is in Jerusalem. And whereas all the silver and gold that you may find in all the province of Babylon, along with the free will offering of the people and the priests, are to be freely offered for the house of their God in Jerusalem. Now, therefore, be careful to buy with this money bulls, rams, and lambs with their grain offerings and their drink offerings, and offer them on the altar of the house of your God in Jerusalem. And whatever seems good to you and your brethren to do, with the rest of the silver and the gold, do it according to the will of your God. Also the articles that are given to you for the service of the house of your God, deliver in full before the God of Jerusalem. And whatever more may be needed for the house of your God, which you may have occasion to provide, pay for it from the king's treasury. And I, even I, Artaxerxes the king, issue a decree to all the treasurers who are in the region beyond the river, that whatever Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven, may require of you, let it be done diligently. Up to 100 talents of silver, 100 cores of wheat, 100 baths of wine, 100 baths of oil, and salt without prescribed limit. Whatever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it diligently be done for the house of the God of heaven. For why should there be wrath against the realm of the king and his sons? Also we inform you that it shall not be lawful to impose tax, tribute, or custom on any of the priests, Levites, singers, gatekeepers, Nethanim, or servants of this house of God. And you, Ezra, according to your God-given wisdom, set magistrates and judges who may judge all the people who are in the region beyond the river, all such as know the laws of your God, and teach those who do not know them. Whoever will not observe the law of your God and the law of the king, let judgment be executed speedily on him, whether it be death or banishment or confiscation of goods or imprisonment. Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers who has put such a thing as this in the king's heart to beautify the house of the Lord which is in Jerusalem and has extended mercy to me before the king and his counsellors and before all the king's mighty princes. So I was encouraged as the hand of the Lord my God was upon me and I gathered leading men of Israel to go up with me. Amen. <clears throat> Let's begin by looking to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, most merciful God, we thank you for bringing us together once again for this time of conference. Thank you that your mercies are new every morning. Thank you that you've given us opportunity to 
I turn aside from our regular activities to be here together, to be able to fellowship one with another and to most of all come to worship you and hear you speaking to us in the word. Lord, we ask that you would give help and understanding to us today. Lord, we confess our minds are so darkened by our own sinfulness and how slow of heart we are to understand the things that we find in your word. So we again come to you and ask that you would give help to us, uh, give illumination to our minds, give us understanding and help us both as uh, we listen and as the word is preached. Lord, we need your Holy Spirit and we thank you that you've promised to give him to us. And so we ask, Lord, that your spirit would move uh, as the word is going forth and that you would do your sanctifying work in our lives and that we would be more and more conformed to the image of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. So please bless our time now as we commit it to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> there was that time in the life of the great Welsh preacher, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, when working as a medical physician, he was called into the office of his superiors to explain his decision, one that they had heard about through the newspapers, that he was planning to leave the medical profession and return to Wales as a preacher. And his colleagues were really quite mystified and perplexed about this, as why he would want to do such a thing, approaching as he was the very summit of the medical profession and with the world seemingly at his feet, why would he want to leave a career as a top Harley Street surgeon in London and go back to Wales? They just couldn't understand it. They just couldn't seem to get their minds around it. And so Dr. Lloyd-Jones had to explain to them something of his burden, something of this desire he had to go back to his homeland, back to Wales, back to his own people and to bring to them the word of God, something which was in the end a very significant moment in the history of the church in the UK and even beyond that. Well, I wonder if there wasn't a similar kind of conversation that took place in the office of King Artaxerxes in Babylon all those years ago. I wonder if King Artaxerxes wasn't himself also at first equally perplexed, equally mystified by this decision of Ezra to leave Babylon and that very senior position he had in government there with all the perks and with all the prospects to leave all of that behind and to make that a long long journey back to Judah, back to Jerusalem, back to his own people to teach and preach the word of God to them. What Was Artaxerxes himself a little bit perplexed by this? Was he mystified by this decision? Well, I mean, we don't know for sure, but what we do know is that that was certainly one of the primary motivating factors behind Ezra's desire to go. It was his love for his people, his burden for his people, and his desire to see those people turning back once again to ways of spiritual obedience and to begin walking closely with the Lord once more. Because 60 years have passed at this point, just to give you the context here, 60 years have passed since the close of chapter 6 in the book, Zerubbabel and Jeshua, those great leaders, the men of that generation, they passed on from the scene. Uh, and with that, sadly, a time of backsliding has begun. So that the people of God, um, perhaps succumbing to the pressure and tension of being in that Samaritan-dominated culture, they have themselves begun to slip back into ways of compromise and spiritual decline. And so here's Ezra then, here's this godly man Ezra, and he's troubled by these things, he's burdened by these things, he's grieved by these reports he hears coming out of Jerusalem concerning the people and their deteriorating, declining spiritual condition. And so what does Ezra do? Well, he goes into the king goes into the king and petitions the king that he might allow him to go back and to take with him a working party of God's people, a group of exiles with the same kind of desire that he has to go back, back home, back to Judah in order that a work of reformation might be begun. And as we see here in this chapter, surprisingly, King Artaxerxes, he agrees. He says yes to Ezra's request. And so this is what we want to think about this morning, the second return of the exiles here in chapter 7, back to Jerusalem under the leadership of this man Ezra. And what we want to look at particularly this morning are the spiritual qualities that we find 
in Ezra. Some of the features, the traits, the spiritual characteristics of Ezra that we see, especially in verse 10 of chapter 7. Because verse 10, we're going to take that as a sort of a uh, window text, if you like, that casts a whole lot of light here upon the spiritual characteristics of Ezra himself and also much of what happens in the chapter as well. Just look at verse 10. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. So there are a number of features here, a number of different aspects to Ezra's life and ministry that we can take note of here. And the first one that we're going to consider is that he studied the word. That's our first point. He studied the word. He had a great love for and a great desire to really know and understand the word. And it's something that really this should come as no surprise when we see the sort of background he comes from, the genealogical background that he came from. Um, you see it there in the opening verses, the, the genealogy. Let's just read that. Ezra, the son of Sariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Hilkiah, the son of Shalom, the son of Zadok, the son of Ahitub, the son of Amariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Merioth, the son of Zerahiah, the son of Uzi, the son of Buki, the son of Abishua, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the chief priest. And so this is the genealogy, the, uh, the family tree of Ezra. And what this tells us then immediately is not only is Ezra a very important figure, because the moment you're introduced to somebody in the Bible and they give you the genealogy straight off the bat, then that's the Bible's way of saying, pay attention. Uh, listen up. This person that you're about to read of is a very significant individual. And so that's what it's saying here. Uh, pay attention. The genealogy tells us that first of all. But then also with that, it's a way of providing credentials as well. It's a way of sort of setting forth his resume, if you like. Because many of the people, many of the exiles, perhaps even most of the exiles, repatriated back in Judah, many of them probably wouldn't know who this man was. They probably wouldn't know who this man was leading this group of people into Jerusalem, this man who stands up with the law of God in his hand. Many of them probably wouldn't know who he was. There was no news media in those days. There was no text message, no Twitter in those days. Um, most people probably wouldn't know who this man was who's just come into Jerusalem. And so genealogy, you see, is a way of showing who a man is. It's a way of giving his background, his credentials, his qualifications. And so that's what we see with Ezra here. We can see from... His genealogy, he's a man with very good roots. He's got a, he's got a pedigree, you could say. A man with a really illustrious family tree because Ezra can actually trace his roots all the way back to Aaron, the tree, chief priest and brother of Moses. He can trace his roots all the way back through the Zadokite priests and through 16 generations of forefathers all the way back to Aaron. And so this is very impressive. This is a very prestigious family tree that he has coming as he does directly from the priestly line of Aaron. And so he's qualified. That's the point that's being made by this. He's qualified. He's very well qualified genealogically to be a priest in Israel and to come and teach God's word and law to the, to the people. So that's one point being made here by the genealogy. Underlines his qualifications. Also, we could say, it gives us at the same time just one aspect to this, it gives us a, an insight into the reason behind his zeal as well. The incredible zeal that Ezra has for God's law shouldn't surprise us because maybe one of the names you noticed as we read the genealogy, verse 5, Phineas, grandson of Aaron and a man who himself had shown tremendous zeal, wasn't it? Zeal for God's law that he had. You, you remember that scene from Numbers chapter 25 when Phineas following Balaam's plot there to try and draw the Israelites into idolatry uh, through intermarriage with the Midianites. And one of those Israelite males had taken a Midianite woman into his tent. And Phineas heard about that, saw that, and so he, he rushed, so filled with zeal, he rushed in there, didn't he? And he thrust them through with a spear. And the result of that was, you remember the Lord conferred upon him a blessing for that. Numbers 25 verse 13, it shall be for him and his descendants after him a covenant of a perpetual priesthood because he was jealous for his God. And so that was the result of his obedience and zeal. It brought down blessing, God's blessing on him and upon his descendants for many, many years to come. Right down even here to Ezra himself. 
And so that's instructive as well, isn't that's encouraging for us to take note of today. We can make that application just from the genealogy. The, the value of faithfulness, true spiritual faithfulness and zeal for the truth. The effect that can have, it's something we can see here. It can reach, can't it? It can reach way beyond our own generation, even to future generations. I remember doing some studies in the life of Hudson Taylor some years ago. He was the, uh, the great pioneer missionary to China. And um, he was a man, of course, had tremendous zeal for the Lord, which not only influenced uh, his own generation, but also many, many Chinese people and also future generations of the Taylor family line. When I was studying, I came across an article that was written a few years ago by his great-great-grandson, J. Hudson Taylor III, and it was entitled, God's Faithfulness to Nine Generations, because Hudson Taylor's own son, Herbert, went to China as a missionary. Then his son, Hudson Taylor II became a missionary to China during World War II. And then his son, uh, Hudson Taylor III, started the Chinese Evangelical Seminary. And then his son, Hudson Taylor IV, went into ministry and pastored a Chinese church in Boston, married a Chinese lady, the first Taylor ever to marry a Chinese woman. And they eventually ended up serving in a church in Hong Kong. And they now have a son called Hudson Taylor V. And uh, in this article, he said, one decision to serve God in the 18th century has influenced my family for nine generations. And so there's application for us there, isn't there? Think carefully and think prayerfully as you make your decisions. In your family, seek to establish God-honoring, God-glorifying decisions and priorities. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Have that written over all of your decisions and all of your choices, because who knows what impact that will have, not only on you, those around you, but maybe even on future generations of your children and children's children. That was certainly the case with Ezra. We, we can just learn that from the genealogy. Now let's move on. He was a man who was a priest from a priestly line, and also a man who's a scribe, it says in verse 6. Now that's a word that can refer to a secretary in an official position. Scholars tell us that Ezra had some sort of a position of power in the Persian government. And so he's probably something like a secretary of state for Jewish affairs. Something like that. He's a priest. He's also an expert in the law and in Jewish life and customs. And so as a result of that, he has this position in Babylon. He's a kind of an advisor, we might say, an advisor to the king, a secretary of state for Jewish affairs. And so it's in that capacity then, and hearing about the troubles that God's people are having back in Judah at this time, and these are spiritual troubles that we're talking about here, backsliding, departing from God and his ways, intermarrying among the pagans. That's mentioned in chapters 9 and 10. Ezra then, hearing about this, in response to this, he goes and informs Artaxerxes the king, and perhaps it's due to his own personal influence with the king, or maybe the king's own desire and vested interest in maintaining peace in all parts of his empire. The king then says, uh, okay, go ahead. Gives him the green light, gives him the thumbs up to go back with a large company of priests and Levites and singers and temple servants, all the way back, back to Jerusalem to do a work of reformation. And so they go, with all the silver and the gold and the items and the instruments for temple worship, they go 900 miles, all the way back there to Judah. They go, take some 14 weeks. They leave in the spring, they arrive in midsummer, but they make it. They do. They arrive safely back in the land. Now, how? How do they make it? Why? Why did they make it? Perhaps we should put it that way. Well, verse 9 tells us it was because of the Lord, because of the good hand of the Lord was upon them. So it's God's blessing, his favor, his hand resting upon them. That was the reason. And that in no small part on a human level due to the leadership of this man, Ezra. Look what it says in verse 10. The good hand of the Lord was upon them for, connect to there, for Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the Lord. So that's one of the reasons, just on a human level, for the blessing that came down upon these people. It was due in, in no small way to the faithfulness and the zeal and the obedience of this man, Ezra, who had prepared his heart, it says. Set his heart on following the Lord. He loved God's law. He delighted in that law. He studied the law. Look again at verse 6. 
It says he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. A ready scribe. That word means quick, it means prompt, it means skilled, swift, particularly with regard to his understanding. He was prompt and skilled and swift to understand the scriptures. Also prompt and skilled and swift to apply the scriptures to his life as well. That was probably something that's due to his background, of course. He was raised in a family of priests, so he'd been taught the scriptures from his youth, probably spent hours each day studying, reading the word, meditating, pondering the word, thinking through the implications of what he's read, thinking through the applications of what he's read. His mind, his thoughts were soaked. It was marinated in the word. Jewish tradition has it that Ezra actually knew the Pentateuch off by heart and that he could transcribe it from mental recall. And so this is a man who knew God's law. This is a man who, who'd immersed himself in God's law. Also, he's a man who's been made very wise by that process. He's been made very wise by his study of God's law. Even the king can see that. Uh, look down to verse 25. You, Ezra, according to, look at this, your God-given wisdom, set magistrates and judges who may judge all the people. So... Clearly, Ezra was a man who knew God's word. The people, the people could see, even the king himself could see that. And the reason for that was he had set himself to study it and to know it. One of the commentators on this passage puts it like this. Ezra serves as an example for godly leaders everywhere, since before one gets up to say, thus says the Lord, one must know what says the Lord. And so if you're going to teach God's word, you've got to make sure as best you can and with God's help and enabling that you know what it is that you're teaching. And so to that end, you know, just to apply that to ourselves, we, we need to make sure that, like Ezra here, we're students. We're perpetual students, continual students. All through our lives as believers, we're continually in the process of studying and building our understanding more and more. Um, there's a minister in the U.S., he's called Phil Riken. He used to be the, uh, the pastor at um, 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia. I think he's now the president of Wheaton College. But uh, I remember reading something he'd uh, written some years ago. He was talking about uh, his days in seminary. And once he graduated, he would go and uh, he did an internship with a man called William Still in Aberdeen in Scotland and William Still was a great man of God he had a, a ministry in downtown Aberdeen for about 50 years and uh, Philip Ryken would go and meet with him every day and they would talk about pastoral ministry and the Christian life and so on and so forth and he said one of the amazing things about William Still was his vor voracious appetite for the scriptures and for learning new things from the scriptures he said he was a man well into his 80s but he had a boyish enthusiasm for any fresh insight into biblical truth we're always learning Philip he would say we're always learning uh, Dr. Beakey uh, he would say the same thing to us at seminary he, he would say that a minister should always be on the cutting edge that was the phrase he would use. And what he meant by that is that a preacher should always be preaching and teaching the things he knows, but then always looking to stretch himself a little bit as well. Sort of pushing the band, he said. Always learning to look, taking on new challenges, looking to learn more all the time. Looking to build his understanding. I mean, think about the Apostle Paul in that regard. He, he's there in prison, you know, second imprisonment. He's, he's an old man by that time, and he's... I don't know, has he got months, weeks to live? Who knows? And he's writing to Timothy, and he's asking Timothy, send me my cloak and the scrolls, the parchments and the scrolls. <laughs> Paul, you, you, you're a pastor, you're an apostle, you're a penman of Holy Scripture, you've, you've led thousands of people to Christ, you've planted churches all over the Mediterranean and the Near East. Don't you know this stuff already? Don't you know this stuff inside out? Send me the scrolls. I want the parchments. wants to keep on learning, wants to keep on developing and augmenting his understanding. And that, that's something which has application for us today, isn't it? The danger for us today is that we don't do that. The danger for us is that we don't put ourselves on that trajectory of learning. I'm thinking about Christian people in general. You know, 
But we don't do that. Instead, we're just sort of content to stay where we are. We get saved by God's grace. We um, learn the basics, you know, the rudimentary aspects of the gospel. We know the do's and don'ts of the Christian life. We learn those things, but then we don't really go any further. And instead, we end up getting so distracted by the culture and by the entertainments and social media and just the general busyness of life that we never after that make much progress in the faith. We never after that go really much beyond the ABCs of the faith or uh, uh, the milk, isn't it? The milk, the writer to the Hebrews calls it, doesn't he? Remember Hebrews chapter 5, what he says there? I'm sort of roughly paraphrasing, but he says, you know, I wanted to teach you the deep things. I wanted to get onto the rich stuff. I wanted to get onto Christ and Melchizedek and all of those kind of things, but I can't. You're not ready for that yet. You should be at your age. You ought to be onto the strong meat by now, but you're not. You're still on the milk. You should be teaching others by this stage, but you're not. You're, you're still doing your ABCs. And that can be a sad thing, can't it? You know, imagine, imagine you, uh, you go to visit some old friends. You haven't seen them in a long time, a, a couple that you know, and they've had a baby. And uh, let's say he's a little boy, maybe he's 18 months old, and uh, you know, he's just crawling, just starting to walk around a little bit, and you see him there, and he's gurgling and burbling, and mama, dada, and all of that, and you say, oh, isn't he, isn't he just so adorable? Um, but then you, you don't see that couple for maybe you know, five or six years, and then you go and you visit them again. And there he is, he's an eight-year-old boy now, but he's still gurgling, and he's still babbling. He's still going, Mama, Dada. That's not adorable anymore. That's, uh, that's troubling. That's a tragedy, in fact. And so it is in the Christian life. We need to be making progress. We need to be growing, don't we? We need to, 1 Peter 2, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Grow, 2 Peter 1, sorry, 2 Peter 3, verse 18. Grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what we need to be doing, seeking to grow in our knowledge of God and his word. And so to do that, of course, we need to study. Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation day and night. You know, think about our Lord in this regard, isn't it? His mind from the earliest time was absolutely marinated in God's word, wasn't it? Like Ezra, from his earliest days, he spent his time thinking and pondering over the scriptures so that when his ministry eventually begins and he's thrust into the wilderness during that time of temptation, what mastery of the scriptures he has. What immaculate swordsmanship, he might say. His handling of the word of God. It is written, it is written, it is written. For every temptation that came, it was the perfect scripture text citation. And the devil was driven back. And then think about when he begins his preaching. He preaches the, the Sermon on the Mount. And the people who are privileged to hear that sermon, they go, wow. Uh, Matthew tells us, doesn't it? It came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished. At his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. When they heard that, they said, whoa, I, I've never heard preaching like that before. Yeah, I've heard preaching, but not like that. That, that, was, that was truth and light. That was heat and light. It was power. It was conviction. It was authority. Uh, no man ever spake like that man. Because Jesus knew the word. He was soaked in the word. His heart and mind was marinated in the word. And so that's a challenge for us, isn't it? Are we students of the word? Are we seeking to, to grow in our understanding of the word like Ezra, like Paul? Uh, if we're going to, we need to make time for that, don't we? I mean, what does it say of Ezra there in verse 10? He set his heart to study the law of the Lord. He set his heart. This was something he knew required some discipline, something that required a deliberate decision on his, on his part to, to spend time in the book, to shut his iPhone off, to get away from Facebook, to get away from social media, and to spend time reading, studying the word. And so here we are then. We're looking at Ezra this morning. Ezra, the man of God, his love for God's word, that's the first thing. He studied the word. Not only did he study it, the second thing we can know is he practiced it too. That's so important. He practiced it. Look at verse 10 again. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it. So here we see something of Ezra's life and practice, and that is he wasn't merely content 
to study the word and to know the word. Ezra was a man who wanted as much as he could to, to live the word. The word molded, shaped every part of his life. The word helped him to really love the Lord his God with all his heart, soul, mind and strength. The word helped him to love his neighbor as himself. It helped him to keep in every area of his life as best he could the commandments. That was his desire. He truly wanted to live, to live according to God's law. One commentator says, true theology for Ezra had to be applied theology. True theology for Ezra had to be applied theology. So yes, he wanted it in his head, but he didn't want it to stay in his head. He wanted it to go down to his heart and down to his hands and his feet and the way he lived and walked and conducted himself among the people. The whole of his life, as much as he could, wanted it to be lived in conformity to God's law. That was his longing. That was his desire. And it's something we see coming through in chapters 9 and 10, where Ezra there confronts one of the major sins in the life of the people, one that he'd come back from Babylon particularly to deal with, and and that was the practice that had developed among some of the men in Judah of intermarrying among the pagan women, those who practiced idolatry. Now, when Ezra found out that many of them had been unfaithful and disobedient in this way in allowing themselves to do that, what does he do? Lecture them? Does he, in a spirit of self-righteous indignation, berate them for it? No, what Ezra did was to tear his own clothes, pull out his hair, and sat down in mourning for a whole day. And then in the evening, at the time of the evening sacrifice, he bowed his head in prayer and prayed to God a prayer of confession. Chapter 9, verse 6. And in that prayer, he numbers not just the people, but himself among the transgressors. Oh my God, I am ashamed, for our iniquities have risen higher than our heads. Behold, we are before you in our guilt, for none can stand before you because of this. So that's what he did. That's how he responded. And the effect of this was striking, very dramatic, because the people then seeing this, they followed his example by making their own confession in chapter 10, verse 1. While Ezra prayed, a very great assembly of men, women, and children gathered to him, For the people wept bitterly. So it made an impression what Ezra did there. Ezra's own behavior impacted the people's behavior. Ezra's own response brought a response from them too. Because they could see with Ezra it wasn't just words. They could see with Ezra he wasn't just paying lip service. This was not just uh, empty talk. Uh, You know, in England we have a phrase, all mouth and no trousers. Um, in America, they talk about uh, Texans have a big hat, no cattle. You know, just a, a lot of hot air, empty talk. No, Ezra wasn't like that. He was the real deal. He was the real thing. The Word of God really did shape his life and walk before the people and before the Lord. And so the truth, yes, it was in his head, but more important than that, it went to his heart. Um, Derek Kidner, in his commentary on Ezra, says of Ezra, he is the model reformer in that what he taught, he first lived, and what he lived, he had first made sure of in the scriptures, with study, conduct, and teaching put deliberately in this right order, each of these was able to function properly at its best. Study was saved from unreality, conduct from uncertainty, and teaching from insincerity. So he was kept from insincerity because he lived out what he taught. He lived out what he believed. That's what the word of God was for, in Ezra's opinion. Not just a word to be read. The word of God is a word to be lived. You know, I don't know if they had Nike t-shirts. Well, no, they didn't have Nike t-shirts in those days. But I think Ezra would have had one, because when it came to the word of God, that was his approach, wasn't it? Just do it. Just do it. Unlike so many other religious leaders, especially those of Jesus' day. Do you you remember what Jesus said about them? Um, He said, therefore, whatever they, he's talking about the Pharisees, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. So you see the difference between them? Ezra says and he does, but they, they say and they don't do. Uh, They teach the law, but they don't actually follow it themselves. They teach others, they don't do it themselves, which is a dangerous thing. It's a dangerous thing for a leader to do. Uh, Calvin says this, 
Listen to this. It would be better for the preacher to break his neck going into the pulpit than for him not to be the first to follow God. Spurgeon, listen, Spurgeon says a similar thing. Listen to what he says. If any man's life at home is unworthy, he should go several miles away before he stands up to preach, and then when he stands up, he should say nothing. So both of these men saying the same thing, aren't they? If you, if you want to be fruitful, if you want to be effective in communicating the gospel to others, you need to make sure that you're first of all living out in your own life. You need to make sure, as best you're able, that you're a doer of the word, not a hearer only. Or as Paul says, does in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2, we're to strive to be living epistles, read of all men, so that what we know, what we have stored up in our heads, we should also be living out in our lives, so that it gives substance and to, to support the things that we say and the things that we believe. Also, just think about this on this point, it also makes our communication much more effective. I remember reading a, a book some years ago about, ago about the whole subject of reaching people with the gospel, and the author talked about the importance of actions. You know, we tend to communicate best when we combine words with actions. That's why the preachers that we really like to hear, they tend to be quite animated, don't they? It enhances communication. And um, the example this particular author gave was this kind of scenario. Um, imagine, um, think of a cat. Imagine I describe to you a cat. I mean, if you're already feeling a bit sleepy this morning, you'd probably doze off if I described you a cat. Imagine I bring out a picture of a cat. Well, it might be a little bit more interesting. You might open one eye to look at that. Imagine I then bring out a real, live, living, breathing, purring cat. Then everyone's going to sit up. Everyone's going to want to take a look at that, aren't they? Well, it's the same with gospel communication. We can tell people the gospel. We can talk to people about the gospel. They may listen. They may pay some attention. But when they see us at the same time actually living out that message, when they see that message that we preach being backed up, being supported by a life, a gospel life of deeds and actions, and by that I'm talking about deeds of kindness and concern and compassion and mercy shown to people around us. When they see those two things coming together, then the world takes notice. Then the world really does pay attention. And that's why Ezra was as successful as he was. That's why he makes the impact that he does. He wasn't just words. He wasn't just sermons. He wasn't just a talking head. He wasn't all hot air. There's a life there. There's a practice behind the preaching. And so as a result, uh, Kidna says this, it was he, Ezra, more than any other man who stamped Israel with its lasting character as the people of the book. And so he has lasting influence, you see, because he practiced what he preached. Lasting impact because he lived out what he believed. And so this is what we should strive for. We should strive, especially those who are in ministry, we, we should strive for sincerity and authenticity, integrity in ministry. Um, just to give an example, well, this was a, a newspaper article I read once about a, an American football player who was very open about his faith. His name was Kirk Cousins. He played for the Detroit Lions at the time. And um, as I say, he was very open about his faith. And he said this, I am somebody who lives a certain way and I want to be able to truly stand up to that and live that way so that people who get to know me say, everything I've read about him is true. It's not a facade. It's not a front. He's not fake. He is the real deal. I hope to be the real deal. That's Ezra. That's Ezra in football pads and a helmet. That's the same thing. Deeds matching up to words. Practicing what we preach and it's something we should be aiming to do wherever we are whatever calling you have whether you're out there in the workplace or whether you're in a school or like him out on the football field or many of you men in the ministry most of all in the ministry isn't it living out the truths that we've learned that's what we see in Ezra he studied the word he practiced the word and there's a final thing to consider and that is he taught the word as well if you look at verse 10 again. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. So this is what he did. He studied the word, he, he grasped the meaning of the word, he assimilated it into his life and then he went and taught it to others. So his faith, you see, he put it into words. 
His faith, he expressed it in spoken words to others. And we can see that in this book. He does it in a variety of contexts. Uh, in the rest of this chapter, for example, we haven't got time to go through all of it, but the rest of this chapter details for us the nature of the commission that he's given by the king. And that was to go back then to Jerusalem and to ensure that the law of God was being taught and observed. And then with that, he also has to take money with him to buy supplies for the temple and for vessels for temple worship. And also to ensure that the temple officials and workers were exempted from having to pay any taxation. Verse 24. So in total, it really was an astonishingly generous provision being made for them by a pagan king, granting them not only religious but also financial and judicial autonomy in that part of the empire. It's an amazing thing. So how does a pagan king come to know all of this, to have this kind of understanding about the needs of God's people back there? How could he know so much about Hebrew laws and customs? Most likely it was taught to him by Israel. More than likely, it was the influence of this man, Ezra, there in the palace courts, day by day, speaking to him, talking to him about these things, letting him know about these things. You see, Ezra wasn't silent in the workplace. Ezra wasn't a man who said, well, I keep my faith to, my, my faith to myself. No, I, I, my, my faith's just a personal thing. I don't speak to people about it. No, Ezra made it known. He taught it, he shared it, and shared it with the king, it seems, the things that he himself was learning from God's word. And then that's one example. And then when he came down to Jerusalem, you find the same thing. Ezra's teaching the people the things that he himself had learned from the law. He's now communicating it to them. Nehemiah chapter 8 is probably the best example of this. When he gathers all the people together in the square there in front of the water gate to go about that act of renewing their covenant before the Lord. And um, he brought out the book of the law and he read from it from dawn until noon, and then not only did he read it, but we're also told in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8, they read from the book, from the law of God clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. So he didn't just want to know and understand it himself, he wanted the other people to know and understand it and live according to the law as well. That's his burden. That's his desire. Wherever he is, you see this wherever he is, whether he's up in Babylon, where there's a pagan temple on every corner, or whether he's back down in Jerusalem, in Ju Judah, amongst the discouraged, backslidden people of God. Ezra's desire is the same wherever he is. This is his burden. It's to make known. It's to preach and teach the word of God. In all of those situations, God's word was like fire. It was like fire, shut up in his bones. It was something he had in his heart, but then also it had to come out from his lips. That's a good thing for a preacher. That's a good sign in a young, aspiring preacher. Uh, I remember reading Ian Murray's biography of John MacArthur a, 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 a while back. It's called Servant of the Word. And um, MacArthur tells of the time when he was just starting out. This was, uh, he was at Bob Jones University in 1958. And he talks about the first sermon he ever preached, and it was in a bus station in Spartanburg, which uh, I think is South Carolina, somewhere like that. And he went in there, Bible in hand, and he started to preach. Terrible sermon, he said. The people looked at him as if there was something wrong with him. Poor kid, he looked so intelligent, so sad, must be something wrong with him. And so he said he went on to the next place. He went to a high school dance and sat outside, and as the kids went into the dance, he was sharing the gospel with them as they went in. He said, that's how I got my start in preaching. It wasn't memorable, but I was, listen to this, I was eager to preach. I was determined to be ready. Whenever I was called on, I would go to rescue missions and military bases where I could, wherever I could, to preach. And so, shouldn't we do the same? Especially those who are in ministry. Or Just to give another example, there used to be a minister in England some years ago. His name was John Marshall. He was a sort of personal ministerial hero of mine if you can use that phrase I don't know but uh, uh, he's now gone to be with the Lord but he was a man who faithfully for many years engaged in open air preaching and uh, not many in England still doing that but he did it faithfully for many years and the Banner of Truth also brought out a biography about him about John Marshall and in it his daughter uh, she gave some recollections she said this as a child I did not appreciate the huge strength of character and faith which it took for him to stand there as he did week after week. But I came to find it awe-inspiring as an adult. 
At one point some years ago, he tended to stop preaching if it started to rain, until one market trader, a regular listener, teased him about it, declaring that the traders kept on going even when the rain was pouring down. From that moment, Dad refused to stop, no matter what the weather was like. On occasions, there were torrents of abuse to bear, contemptuous remarks made, and even rotten fruit was thrown at him. He remained resolute and courteous at all times. He did this every Saturday afternoon for 30 years. Uh, in fact, she, she tells the story of a, a friend of her brother's who was converted, went into missionary service, and left England, went to serve the Lord overseas, came back 25 years later. He said England had changed dramatically, <laughs> but one thing was still the same. He went into the marketplace, and John Marshall was still there preaching on a Saturday afternoon. Hadn't changed, he was still there, just as bold and fiery as ever. Well, you know, maybe we're not all open-air evangelists, but we are called to be witnesses. We are all called to give a reason for the hope that is within us. Uh, it's no good saying I'm a silent witness. Uh, you know, I let my life speak. Well, you yeah, know, that's good. Our lives should speak. But your lives aren't going to speak about substitutionary atonement. Your lives aren't going to speak specifically about justification by faith. Your life isn't going to speak about heaven and hell and all of those things for that you need to open your mouth. For that, you need to speak. Your, your faith needs to be translated into words. I believe, therefore, I have spoken. Now, is it all about us? Is it all about our gifts and usefulness? Was it all about Ezra's gifts and usefulness? No, it wasn't. There's, just as we finish here, there's a little phrase that occurs three times in this chapter. The good hand of the Lord was upon him. You know, without that, all of his studying, all of his teaching would have been in vain. Without that, his preaching would have been in vain unless the Lord had been going before him, removing hindrances, clearing away the obstacles, opening doors, turning the hearts of kings like a water course. It would all have been futile. All of his gifts and teaching would have accomplished nothing if it hadn't been attended upon by the blessing of God. You know, I mentioned that book about John MacArthur. He also recalls uh, God's blessing on the church there, how the church in California began to grow. He says, there is no technique or system that will guarantee a large church. The church is a supernatural work. I must describe our church's numerical and spiritual growth to the will of our sovereign God. So he's saying the same thing. It doesn't matter what skills and gifts, abilities you have. What we need most of all is the hand, the good hand of the Lord. If the Lord doesn't build the house, then they labor in vain. Who build it? Jesus said that, didn't he, to his disciples? Without me, you can do nothing. Nothing really fruitful, nothing effective, nothing for eternity. But with him, through him, Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so that's what we need, isn't it? Yes, we need gifts and skills and abilities and all of those things, but we must ask most of all that the Lord would look down with favor, that the Lord would smile, that the Lord would bless our labors, just as he did that work in Judah, so that we, by God's grace, can say, yes, the work is going forward. Uh, saints are being strengthened and the sinners are being saved. Is it because of us and our gifts? No. It's because the good hand of the Lord is upon us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, this testimony, this record of the, uh, the life of Ezra. We thank you he was a man of such eminent qualities who studied your word and practiced your word and then he went and taught your word. And Lord, we ask that you would work these truths into our lives as well. Help us to be those who truly love your word, may we say. As the psalmist did, oh, how I love your Lord is my meditation day and night. And may we also uh, seek to live it as well. Help us, Lord, in this. May the truth, as it goes into our minds, may it make that journey down from our head into our hearts and into our hands and feet and out into our lives and oh lord please help us to teach it to others lord we do feel how inadequate we are and how we fail in this so lord we pray that you would help us to stir up what gift there is to become more skilled in sharing your word and to, and to be ready lord to have that eagerness that ezra had lord may we be uh, ready to preach the word in season and out of season. Lord, we need your help. We ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions that I would like to ask concerning what we have uh, learned? Any questions? Nothing, eh? Oh, okay, there's one here. Oh, one there. <laughs> oh, thank you for the teaching. Uh, I would like to be enlightened over what we have been taught and we have been given a good example for Ezra's genealogy but uh, as at now the genealogy of Ezra is giving us a good example what makes the difference in this family tree, where as uh, the next generation coming, the founders of the genealogy could be in the upright standing, but in the long run, you find others missing the mark. It can happen even the genealogy you can pick even a church. The leader of the church can be in the good standing. He has made it possible for it to stand, but ah, on the way, <laughs> you see you still find things not moving in the right way according to the founder. What is the real cause for the diversion? I don't know if in my question can be understood clearly. Yeah, is it okay? You, you've understood the question. I think so, yeah. yeah. So I think you're saying that so just because you have a good a good heritage that that's no guarantee that uh, it will continue on into the future, something like that. Yeah, yeah no, that's, uh, that's a good point, and uh, that is something that uh, you see often. Uh, you see it in various areas, don't you? You can see families where there have been a succession of godly men and godly parents, and then you come to a, a new generation, and uh, maybe there isn't the same receptivity to the truth, and hearts become hard, and children can wander away. Um, happens with churches and seminaries, seminaries with great histories. You know, we have that in the country where I'm living now. Amazing, illustrious histories. Um, and then you come to the modern day and suddenly they start to depart. And uh, so this sort of pattern you can trace in all kinds of areas. And uh, I guess, you know, the reason is the, the native sinfulness of the human heart and the, uh, we have an enemy out there who... You know, like the farmer sows good seed, there's the enemy who comes in and sows bad seed. So it's spiritual warfare. Um, those kind of reasons, uh, you know, the, I mean, the way to, to counteract that is, you know, thinking about kind of a family context is just to, uh, to continue to be faithful and, uh, you know, as much as we can to, to live unto the Lord. I quoted that text, as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord to have that as your kind of motto text over everything you do in your family. Um, you know, I mentioned uh, Hudson Taylor there. I, what I didn't say was that um, his father was, um, I think he was a lay preacher, an elder in a, a small church in Yorkshire, which is up in the north of England. And his father had this burden for the nation of China. 
And uh, it's very unusual. Not many people knew much about China, but he was a Christian man. He just had a burden for China. He tried to get as much information as he could about China. And he would gather people in his living room, and they would have prayer meetings for China. And Hudson Taylor was just a little boy, and he grew up in that environment. And he would be used to these prayer meetings where his dad and his men would pray for China. And then Hudson Taylor grows up, and by the time he's a teenager, he wants to go to China to be a missionary. And the transformation that took place uh, in China, I mean, the number of churches, the strength, strength of the church in China now, because of Hudson Taylor and the work of China Inland Mission, can all be traced back to that living room where his dad had a prayer letter or an, an information sheet about pr China was getting men to pray. And now you look at the size of the church in China, it can be traced back there. So, you know, for our part, We've had the truth passed on to us. We don't want our children to, to depart from it. And so these are just ways that we can try to uh, arrest any decline is to make sure that we're including our children in these kind of things and teaching them regularly, immersing them in that environment of prayer and having a, uh, an understanding of the kingdom. Uh, just things that we can do on a, sort of a, a practical level. I don't know if that's helpful, but... Um, I think at the back there, but just a quick question as well. Mm. Um, Ezra, I think, studied. Yeah. So in terms of your own personal experience, what is the recommended you know, sort of balance in terms of a reading plan? Uh, how do you balance? Maybe since I think this is called theology for those in the ministry, uh, what, what would you advise to sort of balance up in terms of reading and study in general um, literature as well as the word of God? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to... Uh, tread on the toes of any of the seminary uh, lecturers here, but uh, you know, if you're already, uh, if you're able to enroll at a seminary and there are, I don't know if you're able to come to one physically, but if you can go on online, you know, they will give you a reading list and uh, they will set out a, a good course of, of reading to begin to uh, familiarize yourselves with those things. I think that would uh, probably be the best uh, course of study. I mean, a, lo a lot of the men here are already in ministry, aren't they? So, um, think quite familiar with that sort of thing but uh, trying to get a balanced reading of um, systematic theology things concerning the Christian life reading about the church um, biographies as well I think is also helpful you know, we can learn a lot just from the things that our forefathers have done and uh, <coughs> things like that can be inspiring as well especially if you're spending a lot of time studying the scripture and studying doctrine it can be good as well just to have alongside that some biographies to see how great men of God those who've really lived out these things have done it so I encourage that sort of mixture of biographies in with those sort of things too All right. uh, thank you thank you um, there's just something that boggles my mind uh, of course, you have taught us very well on, uh, I think when you were teaching us on the genealogy concerning Israel. But there's something that I have observed. Maybe you can explain a little bit. Um, you find the leaders, I think, have problems, especially maybe with their children. You find that you are trying by all means really to bring them up in the ways of the Lord. But maybe, anyway, it's something that I'm not really understanding because I'll give you two examples. I'm looking at Samuel, you know, his two children, as he was getting old. And then that's how come Israel demanded, I think it were the, the elders, you know, when they sat down, they told him, your children are not, are not walking in your ways, so we do not need them. And, of course, God told Samuel to accept to that. So, um, that is uh, one point. The second point, in the same book of First uh, Samuel, you look at the children of Eli. Also, God was not happy with them. And also, Eli, I don't know, of course, according to the scriptures, you find that Eli was told, but I'm not very comfortable with that one, 
Because what I know is that parents normally know their children, how they behave, and that kind of thing. So in the case of Eli, you'd find that he had to be told. And when he was talking to his children, he was saying it as, as though he did not know. I hear that you are not living, you are not doing well. What brings this? So my question is that, what makes it that way? When you know you are a parent, and then you approach your children in the way Eli approached them. Did it mean that he was ignorant? Because according to the scripture, he says, I hear. But I think there is no parent that does not know the ways of their children. You cannot wait until you are told. So I think it's a puzzle that leaders also need really to engage with God in order to learn from the genealogy of Ezra. So I think on the two examples, on Samuel mm -hmm. and also Eli, I, I don't know whether you. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, at the back, Pastor Kawambale. So I don't know whether you would like to comment on the comment, oh, okay. or it's, uh, it's enough. Because it was almost like. He said, a, he said it perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, uh, let me just uh, comment on what he has just said. I can comment. Yeah. I think we should appreciate that uh, Eli's case and his children uh, is a case of the careless, uh, the, 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 the parent or the, uh, the, the, the guardian who, is, who doesn't care about his children. Um, that is one of the fears. You find that those of us who are leaders, the dependents are coming and people are coming to lodge in your place. They go back, they go back saved. Children, your children are not saved. Um, that is basically the situation of Eli. And in the process, I think God uh, demonstrates that he will definitely deal with the carelessness of the parents who really don't take care of their children. I think it was a known case that the children were misbehaving. I just wanted to comment on that. Now I've got a question. <clears throat> uh, now I'll take you a little bit forward in uh, Nehemiah chapter, five, chapter 8, verse 5, and also verse 10. I think we see there Ezra uh, a, a reading uh, the, from the book of the law and I think the part where I'm very uh, interested, and I want you to just make a comment, is in uh, verse 10 of Nehemiah chapter 8. We normally want to pump sense in people who are not living accordingly. You want to give them sense by the word or by counsel or by rebuke. Could you just help us see how we should appreciate the ten of Ezra, of the Nehemiah, where we are told in verse 10 that then he said, go and eat and eat the fat, drink the, uh, the sweet, and send portions to those whom, sorry, uh, let me just, verse 5, the, I'm looking at a portion I was, where the Bible tells us that he gave sense to the, uh, to the word. It's it? Verse, verse 8. Yeah, thank you. So, they read distinctly from the book, and in the law of God, they gave sense and helped them to understand the reading. Uh, what, what, what should we understand uh, the meaning of him giving sense to the scripture? I think the, uh, the, the scripture there explains itself. I mean, he gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. So uh, as he was expanding the law, for those parts that the people would not understand so readily, then he explained the meaning of it and... The, the way that that was to be applied to their lives. That was how I would understand that. And I think uh, a, a lot have come to say that uh, this is what uh, you know, expository preaching is supposed to be. 
So read the law, explain and give the sense. So if you look at the context as well of Ezra, they were just coming from exile. So maybe the issues of language as well mm -hmm. and so on. So you are reading from the Hebrew law and the, you know, they might be a mixture of uh, Aramaic and so on. And now you give the sense this is what you know, the law is demanding and so on, the word of God is. Mm. Uh, yes, sir. Verse 10, it says, For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord. Um, I mean, one could almost argue that it would be sufficient to say Ezra sought the law of the Lord. But it says Ezra had prepared his heart. So I just wanted you to maybe shed some light on what does it mean to prepare your heart to seek the Lord? It means, it sounds like uh, the scriptures are saying you don't just rush into seeking the Lord. It says prepare. He prepared his heart. So maybe a comment on that would be helpful. Yeah, Ezra is a man who has such zeal for the Lord and for his word that he recognizes it's, it's, this is the word of God. It's something that's holy. It's something that's uh, a treasure. And he recognizes his own sinfulness, his uh, inability to really understand God's word without having help from God to give uh, understanding to his mind. He wants to handle it carefully. He wants to really get the, the true meaning of what he's reading. And so in his humility, uh, he's preparing himself. He's doing that spiritually. So he's, uh, before he comes to it, he asks God to, to help him, to give him understanding. And then, you know, some of the things that we mentioned, that he wouldn't just uh, read it, but then it would change his uh, conduct and change his life after he's read it as well. So preparing himself is, uh, he's going through that process prayerfully as he approaches the word, asking the Lord that he would give him understanding and help him to live out what he's just, what he's just read. That's how I would understand that. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure, sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah it's only yeah. fair, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> no, I, I'm just interested. We, we mentioned there um, open air preaching, you know, Ezra going out and standing and preaching from the law. Uh, I mentioned in England, uh, men who've done that. It's not done so much now, you know, in the context that you men come from. Is this something that uh, is done very widely? Is it allowed? I don't know. Is it uh, something that is part of pastoral ministry, seen as your responsibility, that you would actually go out into the, the public place and preach? Anyone uh, yeah. respond so, to that? So what is our experience of evangelism or open-air preaching? or what, how, how do we share God's word? Or we are not uh, doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Any any offers there? Uh, anyone to share their experience? Sorry, you would like to go, Mr. Banda? Oh, Mr. Matpenga. I don't think it's something that is forbidden. All you need is uh, to get, uh, uh, to seek permission mm. from the police under the Public Order Act. But otherwise, uh, freedom of assembly is one that is guaranteed. So you're free to do that. Uh, but I think uh, when the 2000s dawned, 80s into the 90s, we had a number of open air preaching. It, it may not be popular in our circles, but I think our Pentecostal charismatic brethren uh, do it easily and often from time to time. Uh, there are a few uh, 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 dotted cases in the 2000, uh, but I think it is permissible in Zambia. Uh, I personally love open air, but I haven't done it. But uh, uh, I intend to prepare for that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, when I came to Lusaka from uh, Eastern Province uh, to take up the work at John Lang, for the first three years, we were engaged into uh, open preaching, and 
we noticed that much more the youths were in attendance than uh, elderly people. And this is why even now our church, the majority are the youths, and we yielded them from the, the open air preaching endeavors that we took off. And it's, it's a, you know, it's a good venture to evangelize because when we stopped, the community began knocking at our door, say, please, can you continue? We stopped not because we failed, but we stopped because the, the systems which we are using, we, we had to hire, they became very expensive, and also we had no land, no place where we can sit. Because open air preaching, you can't do inside the building. You need to be outside. So we had no place where we could do, uh, go and plant these uh, uh, PA systems to do it. But if we could have and a place, we can continue because we saw a fruit in it as long as you have a permit from the police like what I said. So we, we still believe we can do that. They are okay, they are fine. And the, and the police permit, I think, because in Zambia, again, the bylaws uh, through the council, you can be cited for noise pollution. And that is why you need to get a permit. Uh, now, for noise pollution, that would be the council. So you can explore the, the legal uh, provisions. Yeah, uh, I wanted to, to say something on the question that he, he asked regarding Ezra's preparation. We are told that uh, Ezra was a priest, a scribe, and he knew very well. He had that tradition. He, he held from that lineage of uh, priests. And so for him, even the reading of the law of God was like an offering. Uh, and, and the priests had to prepare the liturgy. They had to lay the offering and the pieces, lighting the fire, the, the incense, in a certain way. And Ezra knew that. So when it comes to the reading of God's word, we must not do it abruptly. From a busy schedule, you rush abruptly. Remember, it is an offering. It is a sacrifice. Uh, is, that's Romans 12 now in the New Testament and the Hebrews. Uh, how do you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable? Normally, a sacrifice is dead, but it is your body. So you prepare yourself in every way, all your faculties, gather yourself before you engage upon the reading of God's word. Because as you do so, it is a sacrifice you are offering to your Lord. Bring God's word to us. Um, so, time. Okay, uh, let, let our sister ask. You know, when you are in the midst of pastors, each question is an exposition. So, <laughs> yeah, but please go on. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to find out uh, open air preaching. Is it only for men or women can do it as well? Or women are to learn in silent even there? <laughs> I was almost going to say, you know, go and ask Habi at home, but uh, <laughs> let's, uh, where is Pastor Rain? <laughs> <laughs> uh, please give him the mic. <laughs> um, no, it isn't for uh, women to be involved in open-air preaching of the word. Um, but that's not to say that um, women can't be involved in open-air evangelism. Uh, I've taken part in evangelism in the UK in many places and uh, you'll have the pastor or some men from the congregation will be preaching and uh, some of the ladies and the young women from the church will come out and stand around and 
form, it's not as useful to just have a, a group of believers there to form a little crowd so that people will come and listen. People don't want to stand there if they're just on their own, but if you've got a little group of people, then they're willing to stand at the back and, and listen. So um, I think there is a place for, for uh, women to support in works of evangelism by, in, in that sort of format and to give tracts and to speak to people as they go by. Uh, okay, let's, let's pray and then we can continue with the discussion. Uh, it's uh, 13 hours, um, 13.02 actually. And then we can continue and then others can dash off to lunch. Is that okay, Pastor? <laughs> or, or you add? <laughs> you never know. <laughs> okay. Yeah, all right. Let's uh, close in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the things that we have learned. We thank you for the lessons that we're able to draw from Ezra. We pray, O oh God, that you may cause that indeed we'll be able to set our hearts on learning your word. We know, God, of how busy the schedules might be and the demands upon our lives, the things that uh, come through, um, we want to pray, O oh Lord, that you will cause that each one of us will prioritize your word, that will prioritize, O oh God, the studying of the law of God, that O oh Lord will be able to practice it and also to uh, teach others also want to pray for the men of God in our Mideast, those who uh, labor in the various churches. We want to pray, O oh Lord, that you may give them a double portion of your blessing, that you will equip them, O oh God, that they'll be able to uh, preach your word, but also that they'll be able to study it and that also they will lead by example. We want to thank you, O oh God, for uh, this time around now as we break for lunch. We pray asking that you may bless the food that we'll be uh, uh, partaking of. We ask, O oh Father, that you will also grant us some rest as we gather later on for the various seminars. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor Bant. Um, I, I just wanted to add on what uh, Pastor said, uh, looking at the question from my sister there to say, can we can women get involved? Yeah, um, an air an open air preaching. You know, if we have ladies who are Christians, we have men and youths who are Christians, we really want them to get involved because it's a purely evangelism. At that particular time, we are giving out gospel tracts. We are also giving out those forms where we want people to fill in to get the de details for those who are attending. So that during the course of the week or after the days that the open air preaching is done, we make follow-ups to those people who have been attending. So women are purely involved in that because we need manpower to make follow-ups. Yeah. 